Uh, okay. Uh, I welcome you, sir. Professor Amit Bhattacharya is a professor of English at the University of uh, Gorbongo, Malda, West Bengal. At present, he heads the Department of English. He has done his master's and his PhD from the University of North Bengal. He has over 20 years of experience in teaching and research. He has attended quite a number of seminars and conferences at the national and the international levels and contributed more than 30 articles to journals and anthologies of critical uh, art, uh, anthologies of critical articles in India and abroad. The areas of his research interest include marginality studies, trauma studies, and intersectionality studies. He has received the Shikha Ratna Award 2019 from the government of West Bengal in recognition of his contribution to the field of higher education. Welcome you, sir. Now, it's over to you, sir. Please proceed, sir. Well, a very good morning to all of you. I hope I am visible as well as audible. Well, uh, this is Amit Bhattacharya trying to make sense of three novels by John Button, the famous Scottish British novelist, essayist, short story writer, broadcaster, journalist, lawyer, parliamentarian, secret service agent, and also one time Governor General of Canada. The three novels that I have chosen to speak on are all associated with the First World War. They are the 39 Steps, which was published in 1915, Green Mantle, which was published in 1916, and Mr. Stand First, which was published in 1919. Now, the first novel, The 39 Steps, is set immediately before the commencement of the First World War, but is about the First World War that was coming at that time. The two other novels, Green Mantle and Mr. Stanfast are about the First World War per se. Now, in this webinar about the politics of representation, a literary perspective, I have tentatively entitled my presentation today as Representation as Othering, Jingoist Cultures, and national typecasting in select novels of John Mother. So, the first idea is that, at least I hope to substantiate that John Buchan's selected novels contain representation of a kind that ultimately boils down to a process and project of other Similarly, I hope to clarify the points that John Buchan's novels, number one, are motivated by jingoistic cultures. So jingoist cultures must be at the root of these novels. And there is also National type casting, not only individual type casting, not only collective type casting, or pointing out people in a different way, in a different hue. So that is there, and that is what I am going to point out. Now, first of all, I must beg to be pardoned because I am not going to tell the story of these three novels. Sufficing to say that these three novels feature the hero Richard Hanning, who is a mining engineer of Scottish extraction, who was brought up in South Africa, 
who has just returned to England when the novel, the thirty-nine steps begins. He is very much frustrated in the old world country, in the mother country, because he had once thought of it as some kind of an Arabian night world, but he is now finding to his cost just in 1913 and 1914 that this is not like that. He by chance encounters John P. Scudder, an American spy, engaged by the British Foreign Office. This Scada has honored a German conspiracy by a spy organization called the Blackstone. The Scada, this, this John P. Scada is suddenly murdered and Hane takes it on himself to continue with the unfinished project of John P. Skada to expose the German menace and also to foil the German plot of pickpocketing naval secrets of the Allied forces of France and England. How he succeeds or otherwise is pointed out in this book. I can just tell you to wait your curiosity that he succeeds in solving the riddle, in solving the mystery, and finding the plot ultimately. Then he enlists in the British Army as a captain, and that journey is pointed out in the next novel that is Green Vacuum. Here, he is given an assignment as a British spy to unravel three basic riddles. He again, including two or three of his confederates, John Scantlebury Blanker, Sandy Arbutnat, and Peter Piener, ultimately succeeds not only in unraveling the mystery of three clues, but also in foiling the jihad that Germany had tried to foment as a trump card against the allies in the Turkish front. And this is dealt with in Green Man. The third novel of the series, that is Mr. Stanford, again tells us about another assignment of civil, uh, of special service that is thrust upon in an unwilling Hanny, Richard Hanny, to foil the plot of Germany again as a counter-espionage agent and how he succeeds, how he combines the roles of soldier and secret agent. All these things are pointed out in this novel, Mr. Stanford. Okay. So let me come to the structure of my lecture. I have structured the lecture in 10 parts. Number one, I'm going to talk about representation, its tone and tenor, how it is ultimately decided upon and determined by who represents and who is represented. Then, I will also talk about the dynamics and politics of representation in this part of my lecture. Now, we all know that representation means portrayal of somebody or something in a particular way. Presentation of facts, events or stories of some kind in 
an artistic way or representation can also mean the act or intention of standing in for somebody else just as in political representation where somebody stands for a group of persons enjoying at the same time the rights and responsibilities of the representative now as shrimati shilpi washak has already pointed out personal is political then obviously the collective or the nation which at bottom is a conglomeration of many persons how can it be a political it cannot be. because subject position ideological considerations interest of self or society or nation is very much important in the whole ball game of representation if dynamics of representation points out the driving or motivating forces either physical or moral behind a particular organization or a field of inquiry then the politics of representation or politics in that sense should also mean the inherent principles of a particular field as it concerns itself with power or status so if dynamics concerns itself with how a particular organization or a field is moved forward then how it works then politics means why does it work the way it does i have already talked about the way the tone and tenor of representation is greatly influenced by the representer on the one hand and the represented on the other so obviously the next thing that should come to our mind is categories we all know that in order to distinguish and also to identify we have to classify persons and things and that is called categorization now categorization in itself is a value neutral term because it is essential for the way we make sense of our world but in case of representation categorization often works in the form of type casting or stereotype why because why classifying people or things or events we have to point out certain features they may be physical they may be moral they may be mental or spiritual now from this there is always the danger that we will ultimately try to iron out or bulldoze complexities and multiplicities and try to point out only certain guided features of an individual a group or a nation that ultimately suits our representational aims now why is this kind of type casting a necessary evil why is this kind of type casting something that we cannot live without because when we make sense of the self and the world there are two contradictory yet complementary processes at work i mean selfing and other we know that i am different from shilpi i am different from shubhayu 
I am also different from Professor Bani. We are different. But sometimes this difference is pointed out in such a way as to point out certain lacks in the person or communities spoken of, thereby converting the difference into otherness. In this way, if on the one hand, the inferiority and difference of the other is pointed out, then in the same breath, the superiority and difference of the self is established as well. And that is why we see that there are three basic dimensions to this kind of categorization, which ultimately boils down to type casting or stereotype. There is an ontological dimension, who you are, who represents who. There is an epistemological dimension associated with knowledge, with cognition, how we make sense of the difference between the self and the other. And there is also an expressive or in some cases, an aesthetic dimension. How we express that otherness or how we write about, how we aestheticize that otherness. So this is very important in making sense of a situation or a group of situations, some a series of situations when such categorization becomes very important. For example, think about our situation on the epidemic. We can very easily identify it with both. We are having to contend with the Chinese aggression in Ladakh. Similarly, we are also having to contend with the coronavirus. So at this or such times, what happens is we tend to categorize, we tend to typecast nations and nationals like China. We think about Pakistan, we always think about brutality, about irrational passion. We think about China, we think about craftiness persistence, a dogged determination. These are the ways that we are programmed ideologically, socially, cognitively in order to make sense of the difference of these nations. Similar was the case with Germany during the First World War because it was branded as the aggressor. By who? By the Allied forces like Britain, like France, Italy to some extent, and Russia, and at last, the United States of America. Now I go to the next part of my discussion. That is, whom are we talking about? I am talking about John Buckle. When I started my discussion today, I talked about John Buckle and I pointed out him as something. He was a writer, a lawyer, a journalist, a secret service agent, a parliamentarian, and a governor general of Canada. John Buchan was born in 1875 and died after an illustrious life a very prolific life in 1940. In 1901, he went to, after, after completing his uh, education, after completing his education of law, 
he went to south africa in the staff of the british high commission then during the first world war oh before that he also was a director of a publishing company thomas nelson and sons these things are important and i will come back to them during the first world war he from 1917 was the director of information of the ministry of ministry of information of the british government then after the war he became the director of the reuters news agency the british official news agency then he became a parliamentary he was always a public figure and never suffered any eclipse as one of my students has pointed out and then he became not only the first baron of prisnew but also the governor general of canada so from top to bottom from start to finish he was a man of the british establishment he was a man who dealt with representation in its different ways he was a journalist represented news he was a lawyer represented criminal cases he was a secret service service agent engaged not only in propaganda but also in spying and counter espionage unraveling mysteries representing the ultimate aim of the allied forces then ultimately he became you remember the real man of the establishment as a peer okay now let us move to the next part of the discussion i am talking about the richard hanesis i have already told you something about it the three novels yes there are other novels featuring richard hane also but i have only chosen to speak on these three novels because they are about the first one okay now we have to understand certain things about these three books they have been categorized in different ways as war fiction as spy fiction as modern thrillers we all know that john buckan has often been credited as a pioneering figure in the field of writing modern thrillers but at the same time as kate macdonald has pointed out these works are also pieces of nationalist propaganda so now let us go to richard hanne the kind of person the kind of protagonist that john buckan deals with richard hanne is a mining engineer of scottish extraction he has been to south africa for a long time in his life he has now come back to india he has friends amongst the south africans he is bored by the drab staleness of the british isles and the beginning of the 39 steps he is someone with just like john buckan his creator he is someone with a great deal of fondness for the empire the british empire for the imperialist powers at the same time he has known and detested the germans like many of his british compatriots and he has a strange gift in unraveling mysteries even though he says i am no kind of a sherlock holmes and i am more of a brigand than a spy 
he, that means Richard Hanne, has a queer man of decoding ciphers. As he says, I can chew on to various clues for hours together and decode them more often than me. Now, let us think about Jingoism, because I have talked about Jingoist culture. What is Jingoism? You may ask. Now, Jingoism, if we consider its etymology, comes from the chorus of a song by MacDermott and Hunt, which was usually sung during the Russo-Turkish War of the 1870s, when England engaged in a bloody struggle with Russia, both diplomatically and to some extent military, never. And it was, it is basically, it is described as an extreme form of aggressive nationalism, which not only establishes the superiority of the mother nation, the self, at the same time, it tries to establish the inferiority of the enemy country. So how does this series of novels point out the jingoist culture of Britain at that time? Propaganda is very much there. When I was preparing for today's presentation, I was thinking about something that struck me while reading these novels all those years ago. I thought, and I googled, I was thinking that John Buchan says so much about German brutalities and is virtually silent about the acts of atrocity perpetrated by the Allied forces. What's the matter? I found out, I was amazed to know that the British were as filthy, as damnable as the Germans whom they wanted to down. In Mr. Stanford, for example, the narrator Richard Hane cries foul over the filthy attempt of the Bosch. His name for the Germans. Uh, you know, for dropping chemical and germ weapons, you know, biological weapons. But I was amazed to know that at the Western Front itself, in the Battle of Luge, that is very much referred to by Hane in the second novel, Dream Mantle. The British also used mustard gas. They also used chemical weapons. And one of the British generals say that we have to kill more enemies than they kill our soldiers. And for this, we have to imitate our enemies in our choice of weapons. This is something that is the unsaid of the text. And this is something that we must, as readers, think about in order to understand the agenda of John Bacan or his ill in writing such novels. In drumming up support for the war efforts, in drumming up support for the war efforts, not only in Britain, but also in, uh, and uh, uh, also abroad. How could we do it? Again, I am quoting the British establishment. One of the um, official communiques pointed out that in order to make armies go on killing, we have to invent lies about our enemies. So sometimes the representation means other 
No, no. At all times. At least in these novels, it really is so. Okay. Now I may, with a, an easy conscience, go to the texts. Because I have tried to make sense of the conceptual domain of mind. So let me take up selected passages and episodes from the three novels and try to point out how John Buchan or his mouthpiece Richard Hannay tries to represent the Germans, the enemies, the friends, and the neutrals in different ways, in very summary ways. And how this kind of representation sometimes serves the purpose of motivation, sometimes serves the purpose of propaganda, and at other times serves as a rouge. Let me first take up the 39 steps. The first chapter. In a nutshell, this chapter contains both Richard Hannes' frustration and John P. Scudder's many revelations. First of all, because Richard Hannes still considers himself as a colonial, as a South African, whose home is the sunny belt of Africa, the Devil Mountains and all that, he only thinks about England as short soda water standing in the sun for an hour without any fees. Because the top of the British bores him. He has been invited by British ladies, imperialist ladies for parties and made to sit with people from Vancouver or from Sydney with whom he did not have anything in common. But they were clustered together as colonials. They were not from the mother country, they were from various British colonies as parts of the British Empire. So they were without any sound reason categorized and pigeonholed together. Some kind of type custom. Then, in the revelation of John P. Scudder, that when he takes uh, Richard Hannay into uh, his confidence, Scudder actually gives him a, a, a lowdown about the German conspiracy. And there, he talks about Russians, about the Jews, about the Germans, in particular ways. So there is national type. And you must read this novel in order to really understand what I am meaning. Let's think about the third chapter of the novel. The Adventure of the Literary Innkeeper. In an inn, Richard Hannay deciphers the notebook of Scudder and comes to know the damnable conspiracy that is on foot. That is at foot. Sorry. And there, when he is chased by some German operatives of the Blackstone spy organization, he actually makes use of representation, representation as rules. He deliberately lets these German adversaries have a false letter, a fake letter, 
presumably written by him to somebody in court in which he lets drop certain innocuous details of the conspiracy and also by telling them via the innkeeper that he has gone along the road in a particular direction when in reality he is still hiding in the inn and he is very surprising to know that he always uses words like clever crafty efficient these words are used to point out the germans when in order to point out the british he talks about intelligence he talks about a term, word like spun similarly you think about another episode the political meeting at the masonic hall referred to in the fourth chapter of the novel the adventure of a radical candidate there also richard hanne now masquerading as twisden is considered to be an australian labor activist because he represents himself in this way in order to gain some respite from the relentless pursuit of the german adversaries and also the police of his own land because he is being suspected of the murder of for the murder of skara who ultimately the german spies have killed we all know that for an ordinary individual like yourself for myself or richard hanne for that matter it is impossible to determine the course of history for this he i mean richard hanne has to get in contact with the high and the mighty with the establishment and he chooses his backer actually uh, sir harry chooses him for richard hanne uh, sir bol bole the permanent secretary of the war office in the, in chapter 7 the dry fly fisherman richard hanne comes in contact with this official and tries to convince him about the substantiality of the accusation of the conspiracy yeah. and then in the next chapter this is the impo- most important chapter of the novel the coming of the black stone you see one of the german spies represents himself disguises himself this is important as the first sea lord and comes to know of very very important naval secrets in a secret conference between the french and the british and this is ultimately foiled by richard hanne how and why because he can see through the way these germans are trying to represent themselves the way they are trying to represent to their pursuers the british intelligence service about their likely course of action whereas they are going to take totally different a totally different course of let us come to the second novel in a nutshell because i don't want to overstay my green mantle is again about an official engagement that 
the now soldier, the now major Richard Hannay receives from Bulevant. Hannay Bulevant, Sir Bulevant's now dead son, was another secretary. And he had by chance come to know about a German plot of fomenting the jihad by fanning the religious sentiments of the Muslims the world over against the Allied force. And that is why they were sponsoring and promoting a seer, a prophet called Green Mantle or Kaba e Harad. And three clues Kasradin, Cancer, and VI were not enough for any ordinary spy of the Scotland Yard or the British military intelligence to unearth the real motive of the Germans. So, Hane is coming here. He picks as his friend and colleague, Sandy R. Butner, and he is given another American spy as a companion, that is John Sanford Brand. And by chance he meets and forgathers with his own friend, Peter Pina. Now in the first chapter, when the mission is proposed to Richard Hannay, he is told by Bolivar about the German plot and in this conversation, we get to see how jingoist culture and nationalist ideology build up a particular convincing case against the German means. Pointing out the Germans and their war aims in the blackest light possible. Similarly, you see, in the second chapter, Blanker talks about the Germans as very crafty in the feline game, but at a loss or awkward in finding out the naked love. And that is what they would like to utilize against the Germans. He says, I mean, Scantlebury Blank Iron says that as a race they wear spectacles. They need some kind of order, some kind of predictability in order to operate. So they will catch anyone on the road or on the railroad. But in the open country, they will be at a loss. So they lack, according to these missionaries, these spies, they lack the broader vision. They are efficient. Similarly, you will see that in this particular text, during the journey that Peter Pienaar and Richard Hannay undertake, they reflect about the way the Germans have, through their allies, Austrians, betrayed the Serbians, almost domesticated the Bulgarians and the Hungarians, and also duped the Turks. He is very loud mouth, so far as. German atrocities are concerned. But about the Allied forces, he keeps calm. In chapter 8, sorry, in chapter 7, there is a, an episode in which Richard Hanne, now under the guise of Cornelius Branch, a Dutch man, a Boer, an Africaner, from uh, one of the Malice's men, 
men. He meets the German Emperor, the Kaiser. And there you get to see the German perspective also. The Kaiser says how the British are responsible for the shedding of so much sacred human blood. But surprisingly, even the German perspective is mediated by the British perspective because it is ultimately Richard Hanne. And at his back, John Buchan, the establishment man who is mediating the even the German Similarly, in the second half of the novel, we'll see another very important German operative, Hilda von Eyen, along with his brutal, uh, her brutal friend, Ulrich von Stum. They, in their different ways, are trying to manufacture some kind of jihad. But ultimately, the propaganda aspect of this novel comes to the fore when we see how Richard Haney and his associates comes to defeat this plot. Let us, we have come to the fag end of the discussion. Let us briefly talk about the hard novel of the series, Mr. Stanfast. There also, we will see how Blancan, Bullivant, the Scotland Yard man, McGilly Black, Richard Haney, and Monson Ivory, who ultimately, who is actually, not ultimately, it has become a manner, sorry, uh, who is actually the Graf Otto von Schwabing, a soldier, a dandy, from the German Imperial Guard and the master spy or the spy master. How they always try to project their own nationalist ideology in order to project the other nation as inferior, as brutal, as fit subject for discrimination. And this is what is pointed out in this particular series of novels. So, in the final analysis, we may say that the jingoist cultures give birth to a series of post truths that operate on the basis of national typecasting of the enemy, of the neutrons, and also of the allies in order to further the propaganda aims of the British government, the propaganda aims of the director of information of the then British government, John Buck. Thank you. Uh, that was an excellent presentation, sir. Now, I invite you all uh, to ask questions, if you have any. You can post your questions in the chat box, and we will convey them to the speaker. Yes, sir. Hello. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Dr. Amit Bhattacharya, thank you for this excellent presentation. So, I would uh, uh, like you to uh, say something about the uh, politics of representation, especially with reference to the question of race. The politics of representation with reference to? Race, issue of race. Because it has become very contemporary nowadays, especially with reference to race. Okay, thank you for this question. Uh, actually, you know, uh, any, any kind of national typecasting always has an ethnic dimension to it. You know, when we, when we categorize others or otherize people, 
one of the most important reasons for that is race is ethnicity that subsumes race religion caste etc now you know in the case of race there are both physical and mental features that anthropologists have often taught because you know from the birth of nationalism onwards race has become one of the dominating factors in the project and process of other things so you will see that the in, in, in all these novels by john bakan that i have talked about the germans are made fun of for their bullet shaped heads for their bulging necks for their enormous girth and even even uh, scantlebury blankiron becomes so sexy when he says that i don't want to be impolite about the female species of our kind but you know the german variety often reminds me of well fed cows so and and and, and the how they are being categorized as the tutor as the hun as the bosch and that racial feature is being denounced as one of the most important motivating factors for their aggressive nationalism in green mantle for example during one encounter between richard hanne now masquerading as cornelius brant and his two hosts bonstone and godier a very important and uh, very kindly german engineer here he says for the first time i found that there is something peculiar about the german race they were motivated by a curious collective nationalism that was at once great and dangerous so organization here is greatly motivated by racial racializing the others and you will see not only about germans about the tars about the tars and you think about yes another another uh, uh, episode comes to my mind when husin a tar talks about the tars because the kurds were being helpful to the germans in pursuing sandy armutnat and his party sandy armutnat if you read the story you will know is now masquerading as the green mantle the real prophet green mantle has died and hilda von einam in order to further her own aims has now Made Sandy, who is masquerading as a Muslim, now Hilda von Einem is making him masquerade as Green Man. So when he is shot at by the Kurds and the Germans, who see in the tar says only a dog of a Kurd can shoot at the Kaaba al Haram. so the ethnic dimension is never outside the purview of this kind of type thank you sir thank you sir for your response the 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 explanation of the thing thank you sir it was a pleasure thank you thank you sir any other question hello 
So there is a question. Yes. Sir, do you think the politics of representation, I mean typecasting of jingoistic culture, has some connection with the British policy of generating imperialistic and nationalistic discourses in literature? Well, uh, it's a good question, but uh, well, uh, yes, uh, nationalism was one part of the British imperialist project. Throughout the Victorian age, we see a construction of the Britishness as something superior, something to be coveted. If on the one hand it was manifested by the almost an official project of writing about British history, people like Henty, people like Stevenson, people like Scott before them, they were all writing about British history and in a way trying to justify the British way, trying to glorify the British past. And even John Buchan talks about the elder England in many cases in these novels. So jingoist culture is very much a part of the imperialist project. Because if you don't otherize the colonies, if you don't otherize your enemies and your adversaries, your, your, your opponents, your competitors, then obviously for such a small country like the United Kingdom, it would not have been possible to establish a worldwide empire. And this is what in chapter 15 of uh, Mr. Stanfast, uh, the chapter is titled John Bl yeah, Bl Blanchard and Discourses on Love and War. This thing is pointed out, even though in a guarded, officially sanctioned way, whereby the American outsider, but an ally, tries to point out the greatness of the British national aim. And because this was very important in order to fight the Germans who were going all out, out bald-headed for victory. Thank you, sir. Okay, sir. Thank you then. Thanks a lot. It was an excellent presentation. And uh, uh, once again, thank you, sir. Okay, it was really a pleasure for me to actually come and, and address you virtually uh, because, you know, uh, both the collaborating uh, departments, you know, of Mazdiya College, uh, Sudhiranjan Mah Mah uh, Lahiri Mahavidyalai and Rishi Mungin Chandra uh, College for Women. Uh, they are not new to me. In fact, I have students and well-wishers in both the departments, people like Shubhayu Chakravarti and, and, um, and, and Shuddha. Uh, the, we, 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 I know you intimately for a long time so it was really a pleasure for me so with this i again sign off by thanking you